Dharma Lekshit Tsomo, Buddhist nun, professor of Buddhist studies at the University of San Diego, uh, one of the founders of Sakya Dita, International Buddhist Women's Organization, member of the Elijah Board of World Religious Leaders, and a friend. Lovely to see you. You're sitting all the way out in Hawaii on the other side of the world. I'm here outside Jerusalem. For you, the day's just beginning. For me, according to normal people's clock, it's ending. And uh, here we are, united in our pursuit of trying to provide meaning to, to the world struggling with corona. Is this corona affecting you? I mean, you're sitting in sort of more or less paradise. Is it affecting you in any way? And is it affecting you in a way that challenges you in terms of your religious capacity? Well, I think, of course, it's been challenging because so many things have changed. Um, my entire schedule for the year is completely demolished. Um, everything, most things have been canceled or switched to a Skype in format, um, which means, well, change is a fundamental principle, of, so that's not unusual. But at the same time, it's a tremendous opportunity um, I came back from India and um, went into a Vipassana meditation retreat. It's a 10-day intensive retreat with 14 hours of meditation a day. And that was, um, it was fabulous. Uh, I hadn't had time to do one for many years. And then when the retreat ended, the whole world had changed. Everything had changed. Wow, that was one powerful retreat. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but excellent, excellent preparation for this time. Um, so, you know, to have that kind of inspiration and refresher on meditation practice uh, was really great, really fantastic. And I think everyone appreciated that. So I think people who have a spiritual practice are very fortunate for meeting any kind of crisis. Uh, Crisis is opportunity, as they say. So, so uh, dwell on this for a second. Are you? Can we see what the world is going through as a kind of retreat? Some people may choose it. Some people may be forced mm -hmm. upon them. Is there anything in your retreat experience that helps you interpret the reality we're going through? Everything. Everything that I've learned in, in my life all of the practice that I've done is all preparation for a moment like this. Um, you know, basically, the, the Buddhists are very realistic about change, uh, impermanence, uh, death, and so on. So life, in a sense, is a kind of preparation for the big moments, such as, yeah, death, impermanence. Okay. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I think that's useful. It's useful to know that some people suffer less than others, even though... Your, your religion believes in suffering, no? Well, it acknowledges suffering. The Buddha was, that was his first teaching. Yeah. It was an acknowledgement that human life entails all kinds of distress, problems, dissatisfactions, and all of that. And that's part of what equips you to, to, to face it head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't come as a surprise. I mean, it's, it's natural. It may be the biggest crisis, one of the biggest crisis that humanity has faced. But at the same time, it's nothing surprising because things like this can happen to anyone anytime. So my question was the notion of retreat. Is the world going into a kind of retreat? Something equivalent? Well, you know, this depends on the person because some people are prepared to see it as a retreat. Other people see it as a total tragedy. And it depends on a person's circumstances. So there, there are, you know, um, spiritual dimension to the whole thing, and then there are practical dimensions. For example, people who have enough to eat will see it differently from those who are struggling day by day. Now, because I've lived so long in India and developing countries, I'm very much aware that so many people are living day to day, hand to mouth. They make enough this day to feed their family this day. There's nothing extra for tomorrow. So a catastrophe like this is major. It's, it, it's a totally different reality than for us 
I mean, I'm sitting in Honolulu with enough to eat and quiet, sun is shining, birds are chirping. And I've had the good fortune, well, then that's the practical dimension. Then we have the spiritual dimension. There are people who have been practicing, you know, prayer, meditation, um, studying the teachings of their wisdom traditions for years. And so they have a kind of um, spiritual resilience, we might say, um, a preparedness um, psychologically, spiritually for different realities, different occasions, different crises. And they may be in a better position to handle a, a disaster like this. Um, then back to the practical, you know, there's those who enjoy solitude and silence and those who are terrified of solitude and silence. There are those who have the privilege of enjoying peace and quiet and others who are dealing with, you know, huge families in one room. So even solitude can differ. Our perception of solitude and silence can be very, very different. Um, and our practical, our living situations are very, very different. So, yeah, it's challenging from many different points of view. Those interested in, um, in silence, in retreat, will find this a perfect moment uh, to set everything else aside. We don't have to worry about all those commitments, you know, our schedules, our deadlines. Um, it doesn't matter anymore, at least for this time. But then other people are worried about losing their jobs. The healthcare workers are moment to moment facing the reality of infection and a danger. So it's very different person to person. Um, so, uh, Lexia, what, what do you have to say to those people for whom it's hard? In other words, great, great, great for the people with the spiritual life and they make the most of it. But is, is there some message you could give to the others in light of your own experience? Well, I think that there's, um, there are many things that we can offer. Um, one thing, for people who are dealing with fear, the Buddhists would ask them to look directly at that fear. Uh, what is it that we're afraid of, basically? Um, and for Buddhists, it would be to look very realistically at our attachment to ourselves. That what are we afraid of ultimately is fear of losing our own identity. Also losing our attachments to others. We're afraid of losing our loved ones. So the Buddhists would try to understand how attachment, um, both to ourselves and to our loved ones and to everything, I mean possessions as well, People, some people are freaking out because of the stock market losses and so forth. Um, so looking directly at that attachment, understanding the causes of our distress, it would be one thing. Um, another thing would be to, the, you, you raise the question of deprivation. Uh, now, are you, we're, those of us who are living in affluent countries are used to buying what we like, going where we like, eating what we like. Um, we've been very privileged. And now some of those pleasures, some of those opportunities are no longer uh, an option. So the Buddhists would think of this more as um, an opportunity for understanding our attachments and for enjoying contentment with what we have. So it's a kind of gratitude for whatever we have to eat, the fact that we have something to eat. We're better off than millions of people in the world. Uh, so to give gratitude, to give thanks, uh, will help to keep our ha hearts happy. So I think it's a time to try to, as strange as it may sound, to keep a happy mind. Um, to keep a calm and happy mind, don't panic, um, to, under, to accept the reality of this moment. Nothing lasts forever. And there are many things that we can learn from this moment. For example, the joys of living a simple life, being content and satisfied with whatever we have. So this is, I think, one uh, important uh, issue. Um, dwell dwell, dwell for a second more on contentment, how one attains contentment. 
So one attains it by giving gratitude for what one has, having perspective in relation to others. Any other keys to attaining contentment? Well, uh, being happy in the present moment, being alive, being grateful for being alive. It's an amazing opportunity moment to moment to enjoy being here, being alive. And even if we have pain, even if we have fear, even if we have losses, we can still appreciate this very moment. And that's very important. Um, it's important preparation for living uh, a meaningful life. And it's also extremely important for dying a meaningful death. So everything that we learn in this life is a kind of preparation for whatever may come. How, do, how, does, how, how does contentment prepare you for death? Because you're no longer grasping for something else. You're satisfied with what you have in this very moment, you see. So um, being aware, being conscious, being completely in the present moment, we let go of all grasping, all aversion. Grasping and aversion are the patterns that bring us unhappiness, bring us stress, distress, dissatisfaction. If we can let go of our attachments and our aversions, you know, blame and, and regret and all of that, just let it all go and enjoy this very present moment then we can be happy at any time. We can be content. And the Buddha said that contentment is the greatest wealth. It's more important than millions of dollars. People who have millions of dollars often have the most stress, right? I don't so know. I've never had millions of dollars, but I believe you. <laughs> Trust me, I've known quite a lot of millionaires. should introduce them to me. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so contentment, life, death. Okay, and then you were about to say something else that I interrupted you. Well, of course, people are also having to deal with confinement. And sometimes they're living with partners and uh, family and roommates that are not always easy to get along with. So some people will think of this as some kind of living hell, but we can also turn that around and transform that into an opportunity for learning many things, for practicing patience. And the practice of patience in Buddhism is seen as the antidote to anger. So normally, if someone doesn't wash the dishes, we can let it go and, you know, think about it later. But now, when people are stuck in a confined quarters uh, with people who don't always think alike and behave alike, then we come across situations where people can drive us crazy. And right now, the rates of domestic violence are also going sky high. So I think um, learning to practice patience, um, generate loving kindness for those around us. So it's a time to practice loving kindness with ourselves, to be gentle with ourselves. That means letting go of a lot of expectations about getting things done and, and all of that. Um, but also having patience and loving kindness for the people around us. It's extremely important right now, and especially if we're, well, in general, right? Uh, what can we do for people in New York right now? I mean, when we see the horrific suffering that's going on, and then we see the ineptitude of many governments in dealing with the crisis, then it's quite infuriating and also extremely sad, saddening. So what can we do? One antidote is to generate loving kindness for all. And that means all, including the perpetrators of the suffering. So this is the way of completely turning around our typical patterns of reacting with anger, hatred, which can be consuming, but it doesn't help anything. It only destroys our own happiness, and it can also lead to problems with others. So here's how we do it. We generate loving kindness in our own heart, 
and then we consciously generate it to others, those around us, uh, those in our neighborhood, those in our com wider community, in our country, and around the world. And of course, the Buddhists would include the animals as well, because right now a lot of animals are suffering too, right? The animals are confined, and many of them don't have enough food as well. So this is a very practical method. I'm going to ask you. And, I'm actually going to ask oh. you. This is it's it's practical, powerful, and for those who haven't practiced it, they may feel it's too much. But I think this is very, very helpful. In other words, you really, you really bring the full arsenal of Buddhist thought, practice, and meditation to bear upon this situation. Happy to help. So we've got, you've looked, <laughs> so you've looked, you've looked at, at this fear, you've looked at this sense of deprivation, you've looked, you've touched on the question of solidarity, by virtue of evoking compassion and loving kindness for others. Um, yeah, that's one point that you asked about, is the idea of interconnectedness. Yeah. And I think that's vitally important right now, too. Normally, we're consumed with our own activities, our own interests, our own families, our own lives, our futures, our health, and so on. But now, what this crisis does, if we can look at the silver lining of a real mess, we can also see that it brings us together in some important ways. We can no longer pretend that we're an isolated individual just concerned about ourselves. We're all in this together. I mean, this is a human problem. It's global, right? And how the virus progresses in Bangladesh or Norway affects all of us, you know? We're all human, it brings humanity together. Um, the cause is very unfortunate, but it can also lead us to an awareness of how we are all interrelated. And this is important from an environmental standpoint too, because often we think, well, you know, who cares whether I recycle? Who cares how long a shower I take? But now, if we're smart, we'll wake up and see that all of those decisions, all those plastic bottles, you know, in our bathrooms, uh, I mean, all of that affects our planet. And it's, it's bringing life into an imbalance that's causing a lot of infections and viruses to flourish. It's creating an environment that's out of balance. And therefore, if we think carefully about it, we'll realize our responsibility to each other, right? Our decision-making affects the earth. The way we treat the earth affects all of humanity. It affects our common future, right? So care for, care for the earth, right? Care for our common home, as Pope Francis says and the Dalai Lama says. They're, this is, this is clear. If we think in a broader view, beyond our own personal well-being, this can be an amazing opportunity for freeing up our self-concern. Because self-concern, the self-cherishing attitude, is a very constricting attitude. It takes all of our energy to constantly be focused on I, me, mine. If we can get over that, if we can start to broaden our view to include others, hopefully the whole world, it frees up so much energy that we can be using for, for better things instead of being constantly consumed about our own well-being. We can broaden it to be concerned about the well-being of the whole. Then we have tremendous energy to make the changes that we desperately need to make in order for the human species to survive for life on Earth. I mean, not to be dramatic, it's, this is an opportunity to understand our interconnection and our mutual responsibilities. So really, really, sense of interconnectedness is the foundation of human responsibility. Hmm. It, it's a teaching that helps us understand our our responsibility, our universal responsibility, as His Holiness the Dalai Lama puts it, 
a sense of universal responsibility. Of course, the Buddhists would take it beyond this small planet, you know, beyond this medium-sized galaxy to the whole universe. But let's start with planet Earth. I mean, that's our immediate responsibility, right? And we can change things. We can. I, I'm convinced that by our, our decision-making in terms of what we consume, uh, can really change things. So now that we don't have all the stuff that we ordinarily might indulge in, it gives us an opportunity to realize we can actually live with, you know, a very simple lifestyle and still be content, be happy. If we're not, we're just making ourselves miserable. But if we can be happy with, oh, hey, a glass of water, do you know what a blessing it is? We maybe never realized how many people in the world don't have clean, clean drinking water? And a lot of it's because of our consumer habits. Our consumer habits affect the water systems of the world. So in these ways, a realization of interconnectedness can really awaken our awareness and change the world in small ways, but together can make a big difference. So, uh, I'd suggested earlier that you could uh, maybe walk us through this exercise of uh, cultivating this attitude of loving kindness towards others as mm -hmm. a fundamental way of being in the situation. So maybe we can translate all these wonderful, practical, timely, and time-honored insights that you've shared with us and channel them to a concluding meditation and prayer that I'd be grateful if you could uh, take us through. Okay. Good. Um, there are many meditation practices that we can apply here. Of course, meditation um, includes mindfulness of breathing, which is something everyone of all traditions can do, simply to come back to our breath, watch our breath dispassionately. That can be tremendously helpful in a time like this. And the other contemplation is about loving kindness, Loving kindness can help us to create a peaceful heart, um, letting go of all kinds of stress. So the way we do that is, first of all, to generate loving kindness toward ourselves. Imagine filling our entire body and mind with loving kindness, displacing all unhappy thoughts, all thoughts of remorse, all thoughts of ill will, dissatisfactions, any grudges that we've been carrying around, just let go of all of those unhappy thoughts and replace them with the thought of loving kindness toward yourself. Pure loving kindness. Hmm? And rest in that awareness for a few minutes until you get a real sense of love toward yourself so that from a loving heart, you'll be able to generate loving kindness for others. So once you feel a nice, solid sense of love inside, then start generating loving kindness to the people around you. Um, whoever's in your family or your monastery or your office or wherever you may be, imagine each and every one of them also filled with loving kindness. And generate that loving kindness toward each one of them for a few minutes until you get a real sense that you love them completely. Then extend the loving kindness out even further to everyone in the neighborhood, then everyone in town, everyone in your state or province, including the animals, and including especially people that you have problems with, that you don't like, that you feel have harmed you in some way. Specifically, be sure to send loving kindness to those people. And then extend your feelings of loving kindness out even further to the whole country, the whole region, and then to the whole world. Then at that point, you can also especially send loving kindness to those places and people who are suffering the most, those who are suffering from hunger and thirst, um, from oppression, incarceration, 
loneliness, depression, whatever sufferings they may be feeling, imagine that all replaced with loving kindness. Imagine all living beings happy, content, peaceful, free from suffering. So we've run through it really quickly, but the meditation can last five minutes, a half hour, as you like. The important thing is to practice it regularly, morning and evening at least. Um, also to practice it when we go into difficult situations, like this time of confinement, if we have problems with the people we're living with. This meditation on loving kindness will prepare us to meet those challenges in a more kind and compassionate way. So it has tremendous practical value. Then, um, to wrap up, I'd like to share with you a prayer for the world. It's part of a longer prayer by Shanti Deva, a 7th century Buddhist monk, writer, scholar, poet. He says, May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick or ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then, may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Thank you.